we are going to uh, announce the next speaker, and that's uh, Mr. Fion Zalvin from Germany. Actually, he's a director of the Stockholm School of Economic, and uh, he is going to have his presentation as well, the bright, the inspiring, just talking about uh, empathy. Welcome him as well. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is John Dobbin. I'm a lecturer at the Stockholm School of Economics. I think I have to take the microphone like this. And um, I want to talk today a little bit as empathy as a driver in business development and also how you can use design thinking in teaching uh, creative strategies and design as such. With a background myself, I'm an industrial designer. So I studied industrial design at the University of, University of Arts in Berlin. Um, I've been working for several years as a creative advisor and a brand manager and marketeer and creative doctor for companies in need, such as General Motors, Opel, Air Baltic, Esco and Deichmann, DDB, BSF, Adidas and so forth. And besides being active in the creative industries, I'm also a lecturer and program director for everything on Teachable at the Stockholm School of Economics. So I teach on Teachable, such as creative thinking and on entrepreneurship. And I'm also a little bit like a song and dance man, so I travel around the whole globe teaching at different universities from France to Brazil and so forth. And I want to give you a little bit an insight um, on a company one time which I just created. I have a small little agency. It's called Not Perfect Education. It's a collaboration between myself, Zirk, one of the leading um, event agencies in Germany, and Not Perfect, which is the most influential brand agency in the Baltics. And our mission is to unleash creativity within the people through education, events, tools, toys, and so forth. Um, but first of all, I would like to show you how do you actually work as a designer. So there's a few steps, they're called design thinking. As a designer, you always start with doing empathy interviews with your potential customers. So as a designer, you always work for others. Um, it's also called human-centered design. Then you go into the definition process where you try to define what is the actual problem your customer has. And then you go into the research phase to understand the status quo of the question you're trying to solve. And you go into the ideation process where you develop as many as possible ideas. And then you take some of the ideas, you prototype them, and you give those ideas then to your customers so they can test it. And I will start with one project, and I'm very sorry, Harold, it's probably the tenth time you have to hear about my shit project, but that's how it is. And around, I think it was ten years ago, I met this guy, this is Jack Sim, he's the founder of the World Toilet Organization, and he told about a problem I wasn't aware of. Like one third of the world population is defecating in the open, they don't have any access to sanitation. Yeah. This is 2.6 billion people without a toilet. And every year millions of people are dying because of infection, illnesses spreading, because many of those people, they don't even have shoes. Um, women stop eating and drinking at night in the slums of Delhi and Bangladesh, for example, because they have no place where they can go and do their business. And of course, those people are living in cramped living conditions. They hardly have any money, so there's, full of, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges. Yeah, there's no sewage system. And um, there's, of course, a lack of water. And so I tried to solve this during my master's thesis as a designer. And one thing I knew, it had to be a toilet unplugged. This was the thing which was clear from the beginning, because there's no sanita sanitation system. But the big question which we tried to dissolve through design thinking was how to bring the shit from A to B. Because the problem is, if you have a toilet unplugged in your living room, for example, in the little hut you're living in, what would prevent you from taking the content of that toilet and pouring it straight into your neighbor's garden? And this we tried to solve through using design thinking, and I want to show you here a few steps. So in the beginning, of course, empathy is very important. You have to start talking with your customer. Design, creativity, and entrepreneurship is nothing which can happen in the laboratory. You can't design anything just sitting in front of the laptop. Yeah? You always have to understand, do your customers enjoy this product? Do they understand it? And that's why we started doing customer interviews to understand the gains and the pains of our clients and also how can we solve them. And 
what is very important, it is not just about asking your customers what do they need, because as you can see here in the quote, if I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have asked, said, faster horses, that's Henry Ford. And he didn't develop faster horses for them, he developed a car. So creativity is very important to find the right problem and the right answer to this. So I did a little journey, I went to India with my colleague, and uh, I had, of course, a few little toilet prototypes already with me, and we had to understand actually what do the customers need, what do they desire, how does a product of desire look like, because when your father, your grandfather, and your great-grandfather was defecating in the open, how can you persuade someone who has hardly any money that he really should buy a toilet? Yeah? And that's what we tried to do by using um, a design catalog where the people we were talking with could, you know, just take different questions and give different answers. We asked the people, do they prefer a horse or a donkey, a Walkman or a boombox? What color is their most desired color? What's the biggest issues and problems they cure within the day? And um, what was very nice, normally when you do such a marketing or the design research in, in Latvia or Germany, the people run away. This is my colleague Noah Lerner talking with two guys in a small remote area. This is like 10 seconds later, they all want to participate. So of course we got a lot of very valuable data. And then we went into the ideation process where it's very important as a designer, you have to develop a product which is desirable, which is viable and which is feasible. Yeah? And um, we started then designing different little, little toilet prototypes from cardboard. Uh, we made sketches, and when my professor saw this, he said, Fionn, if you work like this, you will never ever get to any kind of solution. What you have to do, you have to become one of those 2.6 billion people yourself. And that's what I did. It's also called prototyping for empathy. I stopped using my toilet at home, and uh, my whole apartment was full of prototypes, toilet prototypes. Um, it was a pretty lonesome time because friends of mine stopped visiting me, some functioned, some didn't function. Um, my wife even refused to visit me from Latvia, she didn't even come to Berlin where I was living. One of the main outcomes was the feces transportation tank because we knew we have to bring the shit from A to B and this has to be done in an easy as possible way. Normally when you design a product and you present it at the University of Arts, people come very close to it, they're very interested in what you're doing there. When I put my toilet prototypes on the, on the table, uh, the students try to sneak out of the classroom. And this toilet prototype which you see here actually um, I remember it exactly, it was two days before my master thesis presentation, I went into my little studio where I developed it and I banged with my foot against it. It was filled with feces, fermenting and rotting for several months and it was probably the biggest fart in history. It was so loud, it was so horrible, horrible smelly, I was literally covered in shit and I've never seen so far 300 students leaving a university building. They were in panic, nearly trying to climb out of the window, but it was a very, very good way of getting promotion because I think there were like people queuing up, hundreds of students queuing up then two days later to see the master thesis presentation. We started collaborating together with Sulab International. Sulab International is an organization also working in the field of sanitation in India. And uh, what is special about them, some of the toilets, public toilets are connected to a biodigester and the biodigester is turning any sorts of organic material into gases. And when we saw, okay, you can turn feces into gas, there we had the answer, how can we animate people from bringing the shit from A to B, because the calculation is very easy. Um, feces is gas, gas is energy, energy is money, and then we understood, all right, the people get paid for pooping. When they bring back the feces to the disposal uh, place, then they get even money for that. And uh, just a little calculation, every one of you is producing around 300 grams of feces per day. That's so much energy that on the end you could run an iPod for four hours. Yeah? Okay, on the end, the outcome was a very simple product, a device which stays at home, a device which helps you to transport. We worked with very sophisticated and smart technology, nanotechnology, and so forth, to make it easy to pour out the content of this toilet. Um, on the end, um, the company moved from, from India to Peru. It's now a company with, I think, over 30 people working in it. This company, I stepped out in the moment where the toilet exploded into my face, but it just got ranked as one of the best startups in the field of social entrepreneurship from people under 30. Um, 
by the Forbes magazine. So I'm nearly, I'm nearly in one of those famous Forbes lists. Yeah? Um, but the question is actually, how can you teach design thinking? Is this possible? Can you teach creativity? Can you teach this kind of approach as you have it as a designer? And the problem is, of course, learning creative thinking or uh, learning also design thinking is a little bit the same as learning to eat with a knife and fork. This is nothing which you can read from the book. Yeah? Because it would be a very, very boring book if there would be written, you take your knife and fork and now you hand it over to a degree of 3.5 grades and then with 1.5 kilometer per hour you target your sausage and so on. It would be a very long and very boring book. That's not how it functions. You have to do it through experiencing it and for practicing it. Yeah? This, of course, involves a lot of that. Yeah? That's also why people are mostly afraid of creative experiences and there is, of course, the big fear of failure. A little example, this is Richard Branson. I guess you all know him, and he is known for all his very, very successful companies. But he's also failing all the time, and that's what people have to understand, that creativity and failure go hand in hand. And here, one of my favorite companies where he failed, and it's called Virgin Brights. They tried to go into, to the brightware market, and they failed. Um, they had to close down all the stores after three months. And I think the main reason, one, one time, it's the wrong branding. Virgin Bright is kind of awkward, doesn't function nowadays anymore. But the other reason is because Richard Branson shaved off his beard and he wore a bright dress himself after seeing this picture. You don't want to marry anymore. No? <laughs> That's why I'm permanently engaged yeah, since seven years. Uh, Virgin Pulse, they also tried to go into the MP3 market. And this management of uh, Richard whispered into his ear, there's a lot of dollar on the iPad pot market, we should go there, we should compete with Steve Jobs, and they created this MP3 player with no display and 128 megabyte memory, a music store with 10,000 songs which went offline after two months again, and you can see it here somewhere, it looks a little bit like the people imagined the future in the 50s, so if I would have been Richard Branson, I would fire the whole management who told me to do that, and then, well, probably I would hire them again, and then I would fire them again just to make a statement. The last company I want to show you where he failed is virgin where and actually I don't have to explain why he failed that's why he failed yeah and so failure is very very important but of course the big problem is we're very creative we're very playful we go to school then they teach us the fear of failure and they educate nearly all the creativity out of us and then we leave the school and then we rather go the conservative passes which people have worked beforehand and people are afraid of working the creative the entrepreneurial passes so the big question is also as a teacher how to regain the lost creativity and I think on the end you have to become a child again and you have to start playing and you have to see the whole world as one gigantic playground where you can experiment, where you can try out and where you can fail as long as you stand. Why did you fail? And important is to get up again and then walk a new path. And what is very important is the environment where it happens because that's where innovation is happening, where ideas can mingle and merge. And that's why I'm creating always a workshop environment, which I think is the core to innovation. So I take my students out of the university building. I book a beautiful location, sometimes even on the countryside, sometimes in a design laboratory somewhere in Riga. And uh, I provide them with catering, so I always look for additional sponsorships. We have three days long, for example, beautiful catering, we have music, we have art, we have lots of guest lectures involved. Uh, we have even actors, actors who do in the beginning of the course with my students such embarrassing exercises, yeah, that afterwards they're not afraid of anything anymore. And I call it going through the valley of shame to walk up on the mountain of enlightenment or something similar. And... Um, so we always start, of course, also with observation, investigation. We go into the design process, mythology, understanding the cultural context, environment, the expectation, and also the performances. What is very important, creativity and design thinking, marketing is nothing which you just can work in into the air, so we always try to do it in a business context. So we always do collaborations with different companies. Um, in the last workshop, we have been collaborating with Valmir Muja. It's one of the... Uh, most fantastic little microbreweries from Latvia. And um, also here we always are trying to work with empathy interviews, so I invite extreme users to my workshops. Here you can see 
um, an eight-year-old boy, um, an underground techno artist, an Olympic sportist, and a uh, fashion icon from Latvia. We even had people from top management who run multi-million dollar companies who participated. The students did interview with them, and then they developed lemonades and beers specially designed and with the support brewed and... Um, well, cooked and lemonade and bubbled up was a very, very known cook in Latvia. So they developed the idea from scratch. Then we go into the ideation process. So I invite inspiring people like Voldemort Dudoms, who is also an exceptional creative mind from Latvia. I showed him different mythologies. How can you come up with great solutions in the field of design and creativity? Then we go into the prototyping process, which is very important. So we develop real prototypes of the drinks or the products we have developed. And uh, I invite also art directors into the course, so we have exceptional art directors working for big corporates, working for the big agency. I teach my students how to brief uh, creative, yeah? so the students create a briefing, they give it to the art director who sits within the classroom, and he's designing then with the support of the students the new brands and the new designs. And then comes, of course, the next step where we really produce them. And uh, here's a few of the different examples which were produced during uh, one of the courses. Uh, this is, for example, a very beautiful design. It's a lemonade made for children. And it has this little um, kind of logo attached, which is made from different movable pieces. So on the end, the children can create their own logo on the lemonade. And it's, of course, a taste and a flavor which was developed together with children and for children. And then. Of course, we go into the testing phase, so we create uh, pop-up stores, we go into the offices, uh, and we test the product. We want to understand, do our customers, do they like it, do they understand it? A very nice example is uh, two students of mine, they went to Rimi, and they secretly sneaked, Rimi is a big store in Latvia, and they secretly sneaked the lemonades into the shelf beside Coca-Cola and Fanta, so and there was this weird lemonade, and this was actually for executive department, a course for top managers, and there were three uh, gentlemen in black suits from Russia hiding behind the shelf, waiting as the first customer takes the product, which also happened then after two minutes, the first pro uh, customer bought the product, and then three gentlemen in those black suits run after her and said, well, actually, you can't buy this, and there was nearly a little fight because uh, they, she thought they were trying to scam her. Anyhow, that's how I'm teaching creativity and design thinking. Thank you very much. In case you have any question, you're welcome to do so. Thank you, Fionn. <clears throat> Is there or any questions uh, to ask? Do you believe that uh, creativity is like a virus? You've got sick of it. And actually, uh, here in the audience are the business educators, like the teachers. They are working on a daily basis with uh, young students, actually. What would you like to say to them regarding to being creative? Be creative. Well, well I think... Creative thinking is very important, no matter what you teach. Um, I think it's important that students are able to take existing knowledge and put, put this existing knowledge into a new context. And one should animate children, and one should create an environment where the children dare to innovate. Yeah? So one should not only give them content, but also one should show them how to bring this content to the next level. And for this, you need a playful mind. And for, you know, for a playful mind, you need playgrounds. And in case you want to develop such a playground, you can contact Not Perfect Education, and we help you to set this up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you have any questions to Fionn? Not. It's so really strange. You traveled half of the world. Just uh, to having listening and speeches. You're welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Anna and I'm from Latvia. I'm also a JA alumni. And uh, my question is, um, of course, I know these teachers who are junior achievement teachers, they are motivated and also teaching the creativity to children. But how do you think about the standard education, uh, basically in Latvia? Uh, is it even possible to use the methods you use in Stockholm School of Economics in, uh, in like Riga Technical University and so on? And if it is possible, how to tell the lecturer to use them or how to push them to change the, the thinking? Well, I think students should realize that they're on the end, they're customers and they're, they're, they're part of a, of a family. Uh, and students, if they feel they need it, they should ask their teachers to do so. And, I mean, this is now rather complicated, setting up such a creative environment with getting additional sponsorship and getting all those 17 guest lectures, which we had now the last few days. 
uh, getting all those designers and so on, but there are also very, very simple ways of doing it. I also run the entrepreneurship course at the Stockholm School together with my colleague Andre Stroth, and one of the first exercises we have for the students, which are based on the entrepreneurial mindset, and this doesn't cost anything, it's just one little task they get, and I ask them, um, develop a service for a bar or restaurant within the city, and exchange it for anything you have on you. So the students have to and, and, and get and exchange drinks for that. And then the exercise is called get drunk or die trying, and they have 12 hours time to do so. So they get the task, they have to go out, they have to develop some kind of service, some translate the menus um, in, the, uh, in restaurants, some do marketing, they dance in front of the restaurant with, with uh, funny clothes on to lure in some more customers. And then next morning, till now, all the students came and uh, were very, very successful. Sometimes even they wear sunglasses. Then I know, all right, they were very successful, maybe a little bit too much. But it's very simple, and I think it's just something one should, should approach, and should approach the schools and ask the teachers, let's do it. And it's simple. It's not, not, not complicated. But of course, it's also always very experimental. And I think also students and teachers are partly also afraid of this. Um, and one has to get over this kind of, yeah, over this fear. That's important. But if you're brave enough, this is easy. Do you believe that there is such like a Da Vinci code somewhere? Uh, wh what's the Da Vinci code? I, <laughs> I don't know, the special gene for creativity or something like that. Oh, a special G for creativity. I think, of course, you can be more talented. You can have a talent in being creative. Yeah, you have something like a gift given. It also has to do uh, how your uh, parents raised you. If you had parents who encouraged you to to try out things, to experiment, and if they already let you have a huge playground during your childhood, I think that's very very important. So it's not only the role of the teachers. It's much more the role of the parents to to give uh, children a creative experience. And, um, of course, there's some who are a little bit better in it, but on the end, everyone is creative. Yeah? Everyone is creative. That's, that's, there's no one who's not creative. Very famous uh, Chinese artist, Ai Weiwei, he was once asked, is it possible to learn creative thinking? And he said, no, it's not. The only thing you can do is you can unlearn it. And I think we as teachers, we have to think, how can we uh, rewind this again? Yeah? Because the potential is in all of us, it's only partly forgotten. That's a good point for applause to Fian Zabin from Stahl School of Economics as well as gratitude and coins to you. Thank you, Fian.